Hello and welcome to Unusual Careers, where we explore the variety of careers in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. My name is Shelley. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be your host for today. Today is a very special edition of Unusual Careers as we travel out of the National Zoo across Washington, D.C., to the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Not many people know that there is another zoo in DC. Located in the Natural History Museum is the O. Orkin Insect Zoo and Butterfly Pavilion. Before we meet our guests for today, you will see two polls pop up on your screen. First, what is the name for a person who studies insects? A bugologist, an entomologist, a pestologist, or an insectologist? And second, which of the following subjects do you think a leader at an insect zoo uses in their career? Science, technology, engineering, art, or math? While you take some time to answer those polls, I'm gonna go over the format of our program today. This webinar is live captioned. You'll wanna locate that CC button at the bottom of the screen for those to appear. You'll also notice that the program is being interpreted in American Sign Language. This feature is best viewed from a desktop computer rather than a tablet or phone. If you're having trouble with either of these services, please chat us so we can assist you. Remember, this is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you. However, we encourage you to engage with us in a number of ways. You already saw that we'll be launching polls throughout the program today. Additionally, you'll see that the Q&A is open. Please use the Q&A at any time to ask questions of our guest. Try to keep your questions on topic, and you can always check under the My Questions column to see if your question was already answered. Today's program will be about 45 minutes with an additional 15 minutes at the end for our live Q&A, where we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Educators, if you are streaming for your whole class, be sure to keep your keyboard close by to chime in on their behalf. Lastly, you'll see that the chat is also open for you to message us. Now I want you to find that chat, tell us your name and where you are joining from. While you do that, I want to quickly introduce uh, my team helping behind the scenes. Today we have Erica, Caden, and Emily also answering your questions. And we have a very special chat expert. We have Arthur Earl, a museum technician at the Insect Zoo and Butterfly Pavilion at the Natural History Museum. So you may see some uh, responses from him as well in the chat and Q&A. All right, let's see where folks are joining from. Hello to A.V., Kayla, and Noah. We have Isaac from Toronto, Canada. Welcome, Van Dean Elementary third grade class. Welcome, Kaylee from West Virginia. Oh my goodness, we have Olivia all the way from New Zealand. Welcome. We have Miss Cummings class from Valley High School, California. Welcome. Welcome, Taylor from Saratoga Springs, New York. Luke from Springfield, Virginia. Shout out to Sacramento, California, Samuel Jackman Middle School. Andrew is joining us from DC, local, welcome. We have Huntington Middle School in Pennsylvania, Vancouver, Canada, Southern California. Just, we are spanning the globe today, so exciting. And hi, Melda. And let's see, oh, we have some folks in Germany too, truly an international program today. Welcome everybody. And I didn't see it. We quickly put on a, a joke up on the screen, but I haven't seen any answers for that yet. Um, let me know if you know uh, what Arthur Pod has the best sense of, sense of smell. Um, great. So once again, welcome everyone to Unusual Careers. Joining us all the way from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, I am thrilled to welcome Chris Mooney to the program. Hi, Chris. Welcome. Do you, would you like to introduce Hello. yourself? Hi. Uh, thanks for having me here. So my name is Chris Mooney, and I'm the lead for the Insect Zoo and Butterfly Pavilion here at the National Museum of Natural History. Fantastic. I believe we actually have a map because we have a lot of people joining from across the country, across, across the globe. Let's just see how far spread out the National Zoo is from 
this uh, insect zoo where he works. You can see we are, of course, that panda located in Northwest DC. And Chris, you are working all the way down there on the mall at the Natural History Museum. So even though we're both parts of the Smithsonian family, we are in different parts of the city. And having an insect zoo is quite unusual for this program. We do have some invertebrates here at the National Zoo, but we specialize in more mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. What types of insects are you caring for there? Uh, so we don't just care for insects, we care for all types of arthropods. And so arthropods are the types of animals that have exoskeletons, and the name arthropod actually means jointed foot. So there's about five main classes of arthropods that we keep. Okay, and so how many arthropods are you keeping? So at any given time for the insect zoo, there's about 80 different species and about a thousand individual uh, arthropods. Uh, that's discluding the colony of ants that we have because they their numbers added up much higher. Much higher. And for the butterfly pavilion, it's about 30 to 50 different species at any given time and about four to 500 butterflies. So we're talking thousands of individuals which is very close at, here at the National Zoo in DC. We have over a thousand individuals as well, but we're sitting on about 163 acres of land, which is about 163 football fields for those of you uh, uh, at home. So how are you fitting a thousand individuals in the insect zoo on just one floor, or a couple floors of the, of the Natural History Museum? Well, we have the benefit that most of our animals are very small, and so we can keep them uh, together in like cages and the numbers that go fairly high. So usually some of our colonies can like walking sticks and roaches are about 100 individuals in the case. So it, it's a lot easier to keep small things in smaller space. Yes, absolutely. That's great. And so you mentioned this term arthropod, which includes insects, but not all arthropods are insects. And you said they're segmented animals. Um, folks watching, go ahead and throw in the chat if you've heard of an arthropod before, maybe you have a favorite type of arthropod. Can you tell us a little bit more, Chris, about what an arthropod is and the classifications of them? Yeah, so like I was saying, arthropods are the animals that have exoskeletons. So instead of like us, their skeletons being on the inside, their skeletons on the outside. And so that means in order to grow, they have to actually shed their skeleton before they can get bigger. So there's five main classes of arthropods that you'll typically see. Um, they are the millipedes, your uh, crustaceans, so things like your crabs, uh, arachnids, so spiders and scorpions, your insects, and your centipedes. There are more, but these are the main ones that you'll find. Got it. And these are oh. the ones that we have. Got it. So we have um, avian uh, uh, chats of grasshoppers. We had someone put in millipedes. And oh, Linda actually likes spiders, which is great. So you have all five of these types of arthropods in your insect zoo, correct? Correct. Awesome. Are there any types of arthropods that you don't have in the insect zoo? Uh, so there are some um, deep sea arthropods like sea scorpions. They're not very commonly known or sea spiders. Um, we typically don't keep horseshoe crabs. They're another group unto themselves. And we do have um, some specimens, but there are no living trilobites, which are the other big class of um, arthropods. They will all went extinct. Oh, God, very cool. All right. So your role in the insect zoo is the lead. Tell me about what you do there. So as lead, I'm responsible for um, making sure both exhibits are ready for the public to see. So that means I hold all the permits that the USDA gives us to make sure that we are allowed to keep all the animals that you see. And I make sure that all the animals are fed and all the exhibits look nice. Very cool. So you're, you're ensuring the general you know, feeding, cleaning, general care and maintenance of the animals. Sounds very similar to a lot of the keepers that are caring for our lions and our tigers and our bears and our birds here. They're about this kind of the same uh, job role? Yep. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, for a lot of our animal keeping stuff. Then I have some additional roles that uh, I do all the purchasing for the insect zoo too. So I, I have to do a lot of other um, administrative things outside of just animal keeping as well. 
So I'm recalling, and maybe some of our um, friends watching, maybe tuned in a couple months ago, we had the zoo nutritionist on this program. And we learned about what all of the various animals here eat. And many of them eat some insects, like we feed out crickets and mealworms, but I've never really thought about what those insects are in turn eating, but you're doing just that. You have a lot of these insects and arthropods in your collection. Talk to me a little bit about how and what you're feeding some of um, the uh, species in your collection. So yeah, it's really dependent on what kind, what they eat in, in the wild. So um, a lot of our walking sticks eat a very similar type of plant. So we were able to actually collect it locally. It's called Fatinia or red tip. And so a lot of the big walking sticks you'll see on exhibit eat that. Um, a lot of our roaches and um, grasshoppers and things will give things like yam, cucumber, apple, lettuce. Uh, then we have a lot of predatory animals, so like your tarantulas and scorpions and assassin bugs, we actually give them crickets. Um, so we actually have colony of crickets just to feed other things. Um, we also have hornworms, so a type of caterpillar, they eat tomato plants, and we also have an artificial diet for them as well. Wow. So it really depends. So we have to focus on what they eat in the wild and kind of give them something similar. So it sounds very similar to the nutrition here of finding an appropriate diet to feed out. Um, that's really, really interesting. And one thing you mentioned is that um, the USDA regulation. So the USDA is the United States Department of Agriculture. What kind of regulations um, and rules are they setting for you? Yeah, so the USDA is the, per, uh, is the organization that administers the permits. So the permits say what, in, what insects you can get and keep and so in the permits, they list out how you can dispose of trash, how to dispose of any animals, um, how, um, how to clean everything. In, the, in terms of the enclosures, we got to make sure we have a certain grade of mesh. It's all to prevent stuff from getting out and escaping. We also have to make sure we wear lab coats when we're in and doing animal care, just to make sure when we leave, we make sure there's nothing on us so we can see it easier. So you mentioned preventing potential escapes, which is very interesting. We here at the National Zoo, we also follow USDA regulations. And some folks at um, home maybe have heard of AZA or the Association of Zoos and Aquariums that sets a lot of regulations. And I can imagine why, you know, say if a tiger got out, that might pose some issues. But, you know, we have insects and arthropods all around us. What would be the issue of, say, one butterfly escaped? And audience, I want to hear from you as well. Think about why an insect or arthropod escape might be an issue. Um, Chris, tell us why we don't necessarily want some of your collection escaping. So what the USDA is there for in the regulations are to prevent any new invasive species. So the permits themselves, they're actually very restricting. So they won't allow you to have anything that they might think might become an invasive species. But um, what they'll also do is, is just an extra layer of precaution because insects can cause a lot of plant damage or other damage um, to things and they don't want that happening. So you might know some of invasive species that are insects. And so a butterfly is actually far worse if a butterfly gets out than something like a tarantula because a tarantula generally has a long lifespan um, and are predatory so they don't really damage plants that much. Whereas a butterfly, Adult doesn't do too much damage, but the larval stage, the caterpillar does a lot of damage to plants and they don't want anything like that getting out. Yeah, and we had so many correct guesses in the chat. We had Isaac and John. Uh, let's see, we had Miss Cummings, Classy, all said non-native. They can mess up biomes, absolutely. I'm gonna launch um, a poll here. Which of the following, these are all invasive to the United States. Maybe you've seen them. Which of the following of, are invasive to the United States? Our brown marmorated stink bug, a spotted lanternfly, an emerald ash borer, or a kudzu bug? And feel free to put in the chat if you've seen one or heard of one of these before and where you've seen or heard one before. That's absolutely. And Linda had another great guess about why we don't necessarily want these um, animals escaping that they're potentially domesticated. So um, if they got out, it could harm them if they're not prepared for that. That's great. I'll give folks another couple seconds on this poll. And I'll close it. We're getting great answers. Closing it in three, two, and one. Let's see. 
And folks were spot on. Chris, which of these are uh, invasive to the United States? Uh, all of them. So one that's very common that you'll see up in the Northeast US is the brown marmorated stink bug. Um, so these are really a big pest to humans and they do a bit of crop damage, not as much as some of the other ones on the list, uh, but they um, will feed on fruits and they'll create um, bad looking spots on the fruits because they what they have is a mouth part is like almost like a syringe that they stick in and spit up some fluid to digest the fruit and suck it back up. So they cause damage to fruits and so do um, a lot of the other and things. So like the emerald ash borer damages ash trees. And so a lot of like nurseries and things find it difficult with them causing damage. And because they're not native to here, there's no native predators for these animals. So that's why they're able to reproduce and go and cause a lot of damage without anything keeping them in check. Absolutely. And that's, I think, exactly what uh, Ms. Cummings cost says they can mess up biomes because these invasive species can go, just like you said, unchecked without any natural predators. They just boom in population. So if anyone is kind of local to the mid-Atlantic, the emerald ash borer is very prevalent, has been seen in Shenandoah. So if you've ever gone camping there, you're not supposed to bring in outside camping wood because it could potentially spread the emerald ash borer. And we're getting tons of folks um, who have seen the brown marmorated stink bug before. So that's, you might have definitely seen some of these. So can you tell us a little bit about um, how you prevent these potential escapes, um, especially for a place like the Butterfly Pavilion that um, guests have the opportunity to walk through and physically be surrounded by butterflies? Oh yeah, so um, our lab space and the Butterfly Pavilion actually have two doors to get in and out. So there's always a little vestibule. Um, so anytime there's someone that goes through the pavilion, there's always a staff member at the exit to make sure that before they leave, they get checked so there's no butterflies on them. And if anything does get out, we actually have really tall nets that we have to go catch anything that gets out. So we try and make sure nothing gets out because it's not very fun in the Natural, uh, Natural History Museum to try and get a butterfly because there's some very high ceilings. I can imagine, that's incredible. That's great. And so you, you mentioned the butterfly pavilion. Um, and the USDA is also regulates the butterfly pavilion a little bit more as well, right? Yes. And so uh, they regulate about um, having host plants in the pavilion. So the host plants are, most butterflies are very specific to what plants they lay their eggs on. So if you don't have that plant, they generally won't lay eggs. And because we're not allowed to have butterfly breeding in the exhibit, um, it's to prevent egg laying. And because it's very difficult to see the butterfly eggs, they're very small. And it just helps um, reduce the chance of anything getting out. And so by not having host plants, we don't have any egg laying. And so we can technically breed them because the permits say which life stages you can keep, but it has to be in a very enclosed uh, space that's there's very strict regulations about. About the breeding there. And I think that's exactly that behind the space, the behind the scenes space you were mentioning. Yeah, so this is actually how we receive all of our butterflies. So we get them in the pupil stage. So the chrysalids for the butterflies and then usually our big moths come in cocoons. That's really, really neat. And so then you have them behind the scenes, wait for them to kind of hatch, move them into the butterfly pavilion, but they're not allowed to breed in the pavilion. No, and that's why you'll see some of our big moths in these um, hanging containers. So they're not very specific as to what they lay eggs on. So if you ever see them in there, you might see some eggs in the container. So that's why we generally keep the females in the container and can let the males out. I do wanna quickly mention, so a lot of these USD regulations don't wanna butterfly, breed the butterflies, prevent escape. As everyone mentioned, our invasive species, but there are some um, species in your collection that are potentially poisonous or venomous too, right? Yeah. So we do have some, uh, most of our uh, spiders are, actually all of our spiders are venomous and we do have centipedes and millipedes uh, and, and scorpions that are venomous. And then our millipedes and some of our insects are poisonous, so that means they are bad to eat. It's actually some of the butterflies as well. So unless you actually eat the butterflies, they're not going to hurt you. Got it. So even though these animals might necessarily have as big of an impact on an ecosystem, they could potentially still be dangerous. <laughs> That's great. There's some examples. Great. Um, so wonderful. Um, so we again, we talked about that invasive arthropods can be really dangerous again, 
especially to native species. But arthropods are really, really amazing animals as well and really vital to the success of ecosystems too. Yep. So a lot of uh, arthropods do a bunch of different services. So one thing you, you always hear about is pollination. So you have things like bees, which pollinate um, all types of plants and give us food in order to get fruits. Then you have things you might not think about, like um, decomposition or poop removal. So you think about all the animals in the zoo, where does the poop go? So there are dung beetles and other types of insects that actually get rid of the poop. Um, and then you have things like uh, detritivores, which are like, you're like cockroaches and millipedes. These help decompose things that are already on the ground. You also have um, things that help deal with dead animals or dead bodies. Uh, these are carrion beetles. And then they also serve as food sources for everything. So they help provide uh, food, or big parts of food webs, either from being uh, predators or to being prey. Yes. So I think that a lot of arthropods maybe get a bad reputation because they might look a little scary, but really they serve very important functions. And I had launched a poll here. What are some reasons we need arthropods? I'll give folks another few seconds on that. Um, that's great. And I know that, um, as you mentioned, that some of the, your collection are carnivores. So they sort of help to keep some other arthropod um, or insect populations in check too, right? Yeah. So there's a, uh, like with the bar brown memory of the stink bug, one of the things the USD actually was looking at is uh, parasitic wasps. So they did research with parasitic wasps that target just the brown marmorated stink bug in order to help control the population. So they, there's the natural predators in the localities that help keep um, numbers down so they don't cause lots of damage. Wow, that's really, really neat. Are there other examples of animals that you have in your collection that sort of just have a bad reputation, but again, serve a very important purpose? Uh, spiders in general, they, they tend to get a bad reputation, but they're actually quite good to have around. So they'll keep down the, the pests that you see because they're very generalist when it comes to prey. So any kind of insect that you might not want wearing around, a spider will help keep get rid of that. That is good to know, probably much to the dismay of some of my team members whose spiders aren't their favorite, but again, recognizing their very, uh, their importance. Um, great. And is there, are there any other examples of sort of these uh, species that are, are seen as bad, but are actually very good? Um, so roaches, uh, like I said, a lot of roaches are detritivores. I mean, they help break down organic matter. So a lot of people think there's roaches are always in your house. And the real thing is there's only quite a few species of roaches that are actually go into houses. The vast majority of them are outside and don't ever come into your house. Great. So for those watching who might not be the biggest fan of arthropods, but if we were to come across a spider or a cockroach, what should a person do? Um, for the most part, just leave it alone. Uh, if you don't want it, you can usually get a cup, uh, put it in a cup and then move it to where you are outside where it's more comfortable for you. That's fantastic. So yes, we don't wanna squash them, just either safely move them outside or if they're not harming you, just consider them like another roommate. That's great. So I know we've touched on some of the benefits of arthropods, but there are so many more examples of benefits from arthropods, from creating silk to certain dyes for our clothing, um, honey, sustainable food sources, and so much more. Chris, how did you learn so much about insects and arthropods? So I did go to school and got a degree in entomology, so I, that helps. But a lot of what I've learned about keeping them alive and things is from on-site, like working here at the museum. Great. And you're working very closely with some of the entomology researchers as well? Uh, yeah, so I actually serve as liaison. So I help them do some outreach in the museum um, for the education department. So I help them do like public programming, like you've seen maybe the expert is in programs. Uh, and then we actually serve as a containment facility as well. So if they ever have something that's alive that they need to keep in a contained space, uh, they can bring it to us and keep it in our lab. So what are some of those um, scientists or researchers studying that you are helping to sort of communicate and educate the public about? 
So the main thing that we try and educate is that insects aren't all bad. Uh, so right now we actually have an exhibit uh, with one of the curators of diptera or flies. Um, you can see in the insect zoo is Torsten Dicko and he has a thing about flies and how he, he studies the predatory um, robber flies and he does a lot of work on that. So they actually go out and hunt different things so they don't bite people or anything at all. And it's just uh, help uh, removing a lot of the myths about butterflies or insects in general that they're bad and you don't want them around. Exactly. We exactly getting rid of those myths. They're important. That's great. And again, we're learning so much from them, just like you mentioned with the stink bug of can you use other species of insect or arthropod to manage these invasive species. It's really, really innovative. That's fantastic. And um, so you mentioned you learned a lot on the job. Um, how are you using those elements of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math in your career? So the main thing that we do is a lot of observation in terms of the science background. So we have to make sure we're keeping check on like all the animals, like looking for anything that might be a sign that something they need to either need different food or if they're not doing well in their enclosure, how can we make sure that they do as well as possible? Um, we also have a lot of uh, data tracking that we do in terms of like humidity and other things like um, in terms of emergence for some of the things like we do beetle breeding and some of the beetles can take years to come out. So it's just a lot of kind of data tracking and obser observing what we see. That's yeah. And observing is such an important part of just science and especially animal care science, right? It's how we gain our knowledge of patterns of behavior, whether they're thriving or not, and the things that we can implement in order to ensure that they thrive. That's really, really um, fascinating. We have a question from John here in the chat about, can you explain a little bit more why flies are important to study? So a lot of flies are actually pollinators. Um, and so you might not think it, but like, um, in terms of the fly, they do transmit a lot of diseases too, which is another thing that's important to study. So we have people from the Department of Defense who work in the national collections to help study a lot of the disease transmitting insects. And a lot of them are flies like mosquitoes. There's some other ones like the tsetse fly. Um, so these are things that are important to learn about just to make sure that we can know how to deal with them and uh, they're actually how they live. That's a really important thing to think about is, you know, the Department of Defense, when you said that, I'm like, that's really interesting. But thinking of some vectors that um, some insects could be, one that comes to mind for me is mosquitoes. And if you can think of anything, diseases or viruses that a mosquito might transmit that you've heard of, put it in the chat, just curious. But these are all important things to study. And we have another uh, question. We've been doing a rainforest program here. Is it true that um, some of the, uh, that the cacao trees that make chocolate are one of the ones that need to be pollinated by some of these flies? Uh, yeah, so there are a lot of very specific um, insect pollinator um, relationships. There are some that is very specific to a single species of, of insect that'll pollinate that um, plant or crop. So I believe that cacao is one. Yeah, it's a fly. Uh, the others are moss, others are butterflies, others are bees. It really depends on how they've kind of interacted and evolved together to see yes. what so, does what. For those of you who are chocolate fans, like I know I am, we have our pollinators to thank for our chocolate. So again, another very important reason for our arthropods. We're getting a lot of answers here in the chat about that some insects can be vectors, and that's sort of why the DOD, the Department of Defense is involved. We, I see malaria, yellow fever, Zika, Nile virus. So are any of the entomologists um, in your department kind of studying these diseases and mosquitoes as a vector or other arthropods as a vector? Um, in my department, no, but in entomology, yes. Uh, so yeah, they do a lot of work with mosquitoes. And the interesting thing with mosquitoes, it's, it's only the females that bite. Um, the males don't actually bite. Uh, they only bite also when they're getting ready to lay eggs and feed on blood. So they actually will pollinate also. That's real. I did not think of a mosquito as a pollinator. That's very, yeah. very interesting. So you're working with a lot of different people across departments um, because you're working both with the scientists, but the general public. Can you talk to me a little bit about that collaboration across units? Oh, yeah. So we try and kind of 
share what the entomologists are doing behind the scenes. So a lot of what they do, most of the public will never see. Um, it's available for them to try to find, but it's um, typically not what you're going to see out on exhibit. So we try and share what they do as much as possible. And then we work with a variety of different people from the exhibits department to help kind of share the things. Like I said, that we had the temporary exhibit uh, with one of the curators. So we worked with him and the in the exhibits department to create that display. And then we also had an activity that we made in the curious um, space that we all worked together and to help create. That's awesome. And I, collaboration and sharing of knowledge is again, such an important part of science and STEAM. Um, and so that's you know why we're here. That's great. So Chris, this work that you're doing with all of these various species, you've mentioned, you know, 20, if not 50 different species of arthropod that you work with, the butterflies, tarantulas, mantis, more. How did you get to this career? How did you get to where you are today? So when I was little, I actually started out interested in herpetology, so reptiles and amphibians. And when I went to college, you couldn't get a degree in that. And something similar was entomology, so insects. And so in college, I got I ended up going into entomology, but when I was little, what got me kind of interested in that is I, uh, my mother's uncle, um, and mom's from Costa Rica, uh, was a big entomologist there, and he had one of the largest collections in, in Central America that he donated to the University of Costa Rica, so she would tell me these stories about him going out into the jungle and going on collections and stuff, and so that's kind of where it all started for me. That's really, really interesting. So you just have a bachelor's of science in entomology? Yep. And then while I was working here, I actually got my master's in environmental biology. Very cool. And so do you have any advice for any of our audience watching who might be interested in either entomology or working in this very unusual insect zoo? What are some ways that they could get involved? Uh, so ways you can get involved is kind of just start in your backyard. It's kind of see what you can find if you, um, if you find something that you want to learn more about or keep and try and learn how to keep things. Um, but don't be afraid of insects is one thing um, and other types of arthropods. For the most part, unless you're, um, they won't harm you. You just gotta be careful. Uh, there's a lot of things online that you can look into and learn about keeping different types of arthropods. Like beetles is a big thing uh, around the world where they keep beetles and rear them. So there are some, like, especially in the US, there's like the Hercules beetle, there's an Eastern one and a Western one. So you, they, they actually take quite a long time to come out as a larva, but they get about this big couple inches. They're very neat. Um, and just some other things around, just start exploring. That's amazing. There's a really cool beetle. And we so that is a Hercules beetle, beetle but not well, the one from around here. <laughs> we did have some comments that Luke is also interested in um, herpetology and entomology too. So maybe Luke will follow a similar path. And John has also studied arthropods any, everywhere in their yard. And that's such an important thing, you know, just getting outside, start rolling over a log, see what you can find. You sort of need to train your eyes to start looking for arthropods. We're used to looking for birds and trees or squirrels, those larger, larger animals, but to start training your eyes to look for arthropods. And then you can even take it another step forward. There's a great app called iNaturalist, where if you start looking for these arthropods and insects, you can actually take a picture of it um, in the app and it goes to scientists to start looking to make sure that these arthropods are where they should be to keep those invasive species in check, make sure our native species of arthropods are doing well. And Hannah went and dropped the um, link for iNaturalist in the chat. That's great. I'm glad that some of our folks watching are already going out and exploring and looking for arthropods um, to gain a greater appreciation for it. And again, go ahead and put in the chat, if you have already been out exploring, do you know any of the species you've already found? And if you have a favorite arthropod, I would love to hear it. And speaking of favorite, Chris, can you tell us what is your favorite arthropod? And also because we are from the National Zoo, if you have a favorite vertebrate animal as well, we would love to know. And so my favorite type of arthropod are the praying mantises. So they they always kind of interest me. So we've kept we keep them all the time at the zoo at the insect zoo, and they kind of can turn their head and look at you. And so there's like an orchid mantis you see. They're 
they feed on uh, live animals. You actually have to give them banana because they'll also eat fruit, which is kind of weird for a mantis. Um, but yeah, we keep a variety of them. There's a dead leaf mantis, but yeah, they're always interested in me. And in terms of vertebrates, my um, favorite is the Komodo dragon. Because like I said, I was interested in herpetology. So they're a neat um, type of monitor lizard. That's awesome. And that is our um, resident Komodo dragon, Murphy, here. That's great. And can we go back to those other mantis pictures, especially that first one? The orchid mantis is beautiful. And it took me a second when I first saw this picture to actually see where the mantis was. So the whole thing that sort of looks like a flower is truly the whole insect, right? Yeah, so all of that white is the mantis. So it's actually eating a cricket in the picture. That's so can... incredible. And so it's just like some of our larger species that we have here that use camouflage or mimicry. These are also great examples of those adaptations that even uh, species this small still use to their advantage. Yeah, somebody said that they thought it was the yellow bug was the one that we were talking about. It's not, it's that whole um, white one. That's great. Awesome. So we um, are ready to move on to our Q&A. And I know that some folks might need to leave. So I'm going to launch our closing poll, but continue to throw your um, questions into the Q&A and we'll try to get to all of them. We did have some people put their favorites um, in the chat. Um, Avi and Kayla said grasshoppers. Somebody said earthworms are their favorite. Cheyenne, that's awesome. And somebody asked about the earthworms because their ducks and chickens love to eat them. That's great. All right. Um, Sharon asked, so you went over your favorite animal or your favorite arthropod and your favorite um, vertebrate. What is, is your favorite to take care of the same, still the mantises, or do you have a different arthropod that's your favorite to actually care for? Oh uh, yeah, the mantises, because they're they're not quite as may high maintenance as some of the other ones that we keep. Uh, like some of the walking sticks, we have to change the plants a lot. And some of them are very finicky in terms of humidity requirements, like the walking leaf. It's a very specific humidity requirement for it to molt properly. Can you talk a little bit more about these high maintenance animals? Um, I know from my personal experience, things, you know, like our herbivores, they, we obviously want their food source to be fresh plants. So our pandas in particular can be quite picky about the species of bamboo that we get. Um, so for some people that might want to keep arthropods as pets, there are some that might be a little bit more high maintenance and require a lot more study. Um, and some that are kind of better as pets because they're more low maintenance. Can you give some examples of arthropods on that spectrum of high maintenance to low maintenance? Um, high maintenance is definitely walking sticks, but if you're going to keep them an arthropod, one thing to consider is you should always keep something that's native to where you're from because actually in order to ship anything, any kind of insect across state lines, you actually have to have a permit from the USDA. There's only a very few number of species of insects that you can actually ship across state lines without a permit. Um, roaches are another easy one. So they are uh, the hissing, Madagascar hissing cockroaches are one of the few ones that you can actually get uh, legally and allowed to keep. Um, but then uh, walking sticks definitely require a lot more attention. Uh, things like beetles, it depends. So some can be much more finicky than others. Um, but yeah, like uh, tarantulas are a type of arthropod that's not too high maintenance and you can actually get them pretty easily uh, and they can be quite long lived. So like some of the female, depending on the species, can live up to 30 years. Wow. Uh, males typically only live about five to six years. Um, yeah. But yeah, it just really depends. So it also depends on where they're native to, too. So some can be much more, a lot more strict requirements. Got it. So, that's great. And so, especially thinking of the tarantula, and we talked a little bit about some of these species could potentially hurt humans. We have specifically, can ants hurt people? And what are some of those other larger arthropods that could potentially be dangerous to people? Uh, ants can hurt people. So some bite, some stings, like the leafcutter ants that you saw at the very first slide, they actually can bite pretty strongly. So um, in Central America, where they're native to, uh, people will use the big soldiers as stitches. So they take them and have them bite over a wound to help close it. And because then you can just pop the head off and it stays bit. And because we've had um, 
we used to use a diapers to help clean some of the stuff and we'd send them to get professionally washed in like an industrial machine. Like the, they'd come back with the, still the heads attached. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I just want to repeat that. You said that some people can use these ants like stitches or staples because they'll bite and their head will detach. Well, you can, you can pop the head off essentially, yeah. And just like a natural. Staple. And then it just, it stays shut because it doesn't have any more input. So it just stays shut, yeah. Nature, nature's stapler. Yeah, um, and then some of the, like all, almost all spiders and centipedes and scorpions are venomous. So again, those are dangerous, but really for the most part, it's if you're allergic to the venom. Um, so there are some that are worse than others. So we, our worst things that we keep are like the brown recluse and black widow. And it's more the nature of the venom that's bad, but they're not typically deadly unless you have like a compromised immune system Got it. or are allergic. And you, I've, I've heard before that some of your collection also has other um, defense mechanisms that you mentioned, potentially one of the spider, um, one of the tarantula species too, that they won't necessarily even bite you, but they will like shed their hair. Yeah. So Generally speaking, for a venomous animal, the last resort they want to do is bite you because venom is expensive to make. So for the tarantulas or that are native to the New World, so the Americas, they have a different defense. It's called urticating hair. So if you ever see one of the tarantulas that had like a bald spot on the back of its abdomen, um, what it's done is it's flicked hairs at something that had bothered it. And so these hairs are very itchy, so they can make you itch and stuff. So they'll try and get it into whatever is bothering them's face. That's almost like a porcupine quills but stickier that's really interesting um do you have anything in your collection that is endangered here at the national zoo you know our mission is to save species we need to save arthropods too but you mentioned you're not necessarily breeding the butterflies in the pavilion but is there anything that you have in your collection that's endangered especially that folks at home should be aware about to help spread the message um not really so Again, what the USDA is actually very strict about this. So we're not going to be able to get anything that's endangered. And all the things that we do get, we try and get for that are not wild cuts. So they're farm raised. So like all the butterflies are actually farm raised. So they're not impacting any of the wild population. So we try and make sure we're doing as little harm to the environment as possible by keeping these species for people to see. So if you're not um, necessarily breeding, there's, again, of course, tons of difference between uh, our vertebrates here and your uh, arthropods. How do you uh, potentially tell the difference between a male or a female arthropod? So it depends. So some are, they look almost identical, so you can't tell until you kind of get them under a microscope. Uh, some, they're actually quite dimorphic. So they look very different between male and female. So like a lot of the walking sticks that we keep are very sexually dimorphic. So the males and females look very different. That's great. Sorry. Um, you, I just wanted to repeat. You said sexually dimorphic. Can you repeat one more time what that means? Uh, so that means that the males and females look very different. So like right here, you see the, uh, the same species of walking sticks. So the one on the right is a male and it has wings that are fully formed while the one on the left is a female. So they're the same species and, and they, they, males and females look very different. That's really interesting. What, like, is there a reason for the main difference? Like why is the female almost, is it bigger? I know it's a little hard to tell. Uh, she's a little, they're about the same in length, but the female is a lot, uh, I guess, like larger in terms of mass. Um, walking sticks are very interesting in terms of that because the, the way they can reproduce is a little interesting. So they actually don't need males to reproduce. So the female is going to essentially reproduce asexually by cloning themselves and just dropping eggs that are clones of themselves while the males are add in some genetic diversity. So it helps prevent the population from getting too um, stagnant, like in terms of genetics. Very, very neat. And we have so lots of questions in the uh, Q&A about the Joro spider. Is that the spider that's coming to the mid-Atlantic region? This summer, should we be afraid of them? Um, no, not really. I mean, they're quite big spiders and they're orb weavers, so they make very large webs. So, I mean, you just got to pay attention. Um, so they might make a large web in a walkway, so just pay attention. They won't. As long as you don't bother them, they're not going to bother you, really. For is, This is true with most spiders. Is that, that seems like a kind of a good uh, attitude to have towards probably a lot of arthropods. If you come across them, as long as you don't bother them, they won't bother you. Yeah. That's great. 
Um, we had so many other questions. That's fantastic. Um, we have a question here that we talked about. Yes, arthropods have many positive um, attributes and benefits. Um, there's a question about spraying for mosquitoes or potentially other pesticides. Can you talk to us a little bit about whether there's benefits to that or also the downfalls of using pesticides or mosquito spray? Um, so there's both benefits and negatives. So negatives is that most pesticides aren't very specific to what they target. So you can catch a lot of beneficial insects in terms of if you spray pesticides. Uh, the benefits is, is you can like, there's a lot of like the mosquitoes that transmit diseases actually aren't native to areas. So they're good to help cut down things that aren't native too, but it, it's kind of trying to find the balance. So there's a whole field of study of entomology called integrated pest management. And it goes into that and about best ways of controlling insect populations without causing the most damage. So a lot of times I'll use um, yeah, like uh, predatory insects or there's things where like the first successful program was on the screw worm, uh, which is a kind of a nasty uh, type of fly that was damaging cattle. Um, and so they've actually, there's a whole eradication program that pushed them down into South America. So they, and there's a big, anytime it's found in the U.S., there's a whole thing where they kind of quarantine the area to make sure no more spread. It's really interesting. Do you, are there, like I've heard of um, like co-planting where you can, to try to reduce pests in your yard, it's all about planting specific plants that attract certain plants or um, repel, I'm sorry, attracts certain arthropods and repels certain arthropods to try to avoid pesticides in your garden as well. You can do that. Yeah. Another thing is kind of using like generalist predators. So a lot of times people can buy like mantis oothica. So the egg cases for mantids or people release ladybugs because they're both predatory animals that just kind of help cut down pests. Um, there are a lot of very specific, if you're targeting a specific kind of plant pest, there's a lot of like beneficials, like um, there's a mites that are that attack plants and then you can find the predatory mites for sale so it just depends on kind of what you're trying to do so you can try and figure out what's the best for your situation that's great um we have a question here about a little bit more about your day-to-day -day job i know at our zoo here it's common no two days are the same but can you give a general breakdown of what a normal day looks like for you how much is spent with your actual animals in your collection versus engaging with the public who are coming through your doors versus, you know, the desk work of budgeting and acquiring all of these animals. Uh, so typically my day is about from eight to 10. Um, I'm doing animal care. So because the museum opens at 10, we try to get as much of the exhibit annual care done as possible. Then after 10, usually there's about one hour once the butterfly pavilion is open that I'm out on the public floor and engaging with public. Um, then from there on, it depends on the day. Um, it's either rest, usually desk work or if we have a lot of shipments, I might help unload shipments of animals. So it just depends on the day. But for the most part, I spend a couple hours in the morning doing animal care and then about an hour with public engagement and the rest is all desk work. Very neat, very neat. And how big is the team in the insect zoo? I know we so, have you and we have Arthur who's working in the chat as well. Who else works there? So right now we have about two other people. So we're trying, usually have a team of about six, but with the butterfly pavilion not open, we're, we don't have a full staff right now, but uh, we're working to get back up to the full staff. Very neat, great. And are there any other resources? Like where can students, learn more about your collection and the arthropods um, that you have there. Um, so the there is the, the natural history website. So there's a link to the insect zoo webpage and butterfly webpage. So there's uh, there's guides on there for the insect zoo and butterfly pavilion. You can also look into the curious um, at the natural history it's Q question mark R I U S. Um, and they have a lot of collections. So a lot of the stuff from the insect zoo I pinned and they added to the collection down there as well. So it's, you can kind of explore there. And if once it reopens, you can go and hand, hands on look at things. That's really, really neat. And we have another question here from Ms. Uh, Cummings class about, again, students getting jobs working in entomology. Um, an entomology degree would probably be good, but can you talk about the breadth of careers working with arthropods? Uh, yeah. Arthropods is a very, very large field. Entomology is very large. Uh, so like I said, there's IPM, so integrated pest management. 
You could go into taxonomy, which is a lot of what the curators do. You could study um, evolutionary biology, just kind of insect zoos. It covers pretty much everything you can think of. I mean, there's a lot of um, science and research that go into like, uh, they look at butterfly wings for waterproofing because they're very hydrophobic and repel water very well. So just almost anything you can kind of think of, is kind of you can find a tie back to entomology. Awesome. Awesome. And Megan asked about how the quarantine works for an invasive species. When you get what could be a potentially invasive species to your collection, what does those, those quarantine protocols look like? So what we do is we keep it, it so we have what we refer to as our environmental chamber. So it's the most secure space that we have. So it's temperature, humidity controlled. Um, it has mesh and vents leading in and out of the space. Um, so we keep it in there um, generally so it's as, as controlled as possible. Um, that's pretty much all we have to really do for it. Uh, if if we know it's not going to escape, we might move it into our lab, more into our open lab space, kind of like what you see in the photo behind me. But yeah, that's generally what we do is you keep it as secure as possible if it's a potential invasive species. Awesome. And we just have a couple more questions. Do you receive um, species from other countries? Yes. that are maybe native to other countries. Yeah, so we actually have suppliers that are located all around the world. So one of our suppliers is in Costa Rica in Ecuador and Malaysia. So we wow. work with them to import butterflies and other insects. And another great question, just some clarification. I think there's a lot of misconceptions around arthropods, insects, bugs. They are animals. They have brains. Yeah, so... Uh, insects have a little bit different. So they have like ganglia or like nerve clusters. So it's not like a main centralized brain. So like they can, that's why, you know, there's the things where like you can cut its head off and it still runs around. So they, so they don't have a centralized brain, but it's more nerve clusters that are located throughout the body. And that's how they sort of pass information along. Yeah. Very neat. Very neat. And Chris, for our last question, if people visit the insect zoo at the Natural History Museum, will they get the chance to see you there? Uh, maybe. I mean, I'm there Sunday to Thursday. Uh, so, because we have to cover all seven days a week because we have live animals. Um, so, they might see me. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just yeah. depends. Okay. Yes. So if you are local or are coming maybe to the D.C. area this summer on a trip, be sure to check out the Insect Zoo at the Natural History Museum and the Butterfly Pavilion. And of course, come check out the National Zoo up here in Northwest D.C. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us for Unusual Careers um, and bringing us to the O. Orkin Insect Zoo and Butterfly Pavilion at the Natural History Museum. Do you have any final words of wisdom or advice for all of our folks watching today? I'd just say don't be afraid of insects and arthropods in general. There's some really kind of crazy things that you can, once you get into the field, see like there's ones that use their own poop as a shield. So it gets crazy. And there's also like, very impressive looking animals. So just don't be afraid to look. I love that. Um, and how can you not love that? I mean, so many of those species you just shared with us are so fascinating. I, my mind is still blown from those nature's stapler. We had somebody <laughs> actually in the chat ask if that was an April it's, Fool's joke and yeah, it's, it's not. Real. It is 100% real. I want to thank you again, Chris, for joining and thank you everyone watching for joining us today. And I really hope that you will join us for our next installment of Unusual Careers on Friday, May 6th at one o'clock p.m. Eastern time, where we will be celebrating World Migratory Bird Day with our avian quantitative ecologist, Allie Anderson. And until then, be sure to check out um, our webinars homepage for all of our other free and upcoming April programs. And again, we would love your feedback on today's program. So you will see a survey pop into the chat as well. Educators, if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to fill that out. And be sure to catch up on all of our previous Unusual Careers um, episodes on our YouTube playlist. On behalf of the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, we hope you have a wild day.